There's a place in Mecca where pilgrims, Muslim hajis, I guess they're called, uh, as part of their ritual of visiting Mecca for the hajj, uh, take rocks and throw them at a pillar that represent, uh, there's several pillars, but represent several temptations, or some people would interpret it as the devil himself, that you're throwing rocks at the devil. That's one of the more interesting, from my perspective, um, religious rituals that are still pretty current in the modern world. And it says a lot about the nature of, or at least our view of the nature of, I guess, good and evil, um, the nature of uh, our relationship to good and evil, and essentially our ideas on to what extent our aversions should go. <clears throat> In other words, is hate tenable, um, or is hate a desirable uh, quality for us to have? Because I would say that the act of stoning something, because it brings up ideas of stoning humans, is kind of an, an expression of anathematizing or um, punishing or deliberately harming someone and spectacularly harming them, um, as opposed to um, just getting them out of the way. I would assume that if you wanted to just delete somebody, you would lop their head off, which is another thing that apparently takes place frequently in Saudi Arabia, uh, rather than stoning them. So stoning somebody means that you, you know, stoning something means that you want to, it's at a distance from you and you have to throw rocks at it. You don't even want to go near enough to touch it. That kind of thing is full of symbolism. And that's why I think the, the ritual of, is often seen as stoning of the devil, even though it's not necessarily the case that that's technically what's happening. I have no doubt that the vast majority of Muslim hajis actually see it this way. The devil's over there, and I'm now throwing rocks at the devil. Um, an interesting view of things. Uh, hate uh, requires an other. Uh, it's a subject-object relationship. Um, I, am, I have hate, and I hate something else. One can hate oneself, of course. One can hate many different things. But in this particular perspective, in terms of hating something exterior to oneself, it assumes that there is this other out there, that it is other than me. Um, you know, you can say in an atheistic point of view, there's a damaged person, uh, a person who's making an error, a uh, person who is performing actions that harm others, etc. Others, get it? Um, so you have to sort of otherize something or someone in order to hate it. Um, and I would argue that this takes place even when you hate yourself. You're otherizing yourself because you're hating yourself as opposed to some ideal that you're not living up to. Um, now, again, I understand that this is a normal human response, but what I would have to say is, if you hate somebody that you've otherized in this way, how do you know that you're hating them for what they actually are? See, implicit in this idea of stoning the devil in Mecca is that d the devil exists, you can identify him, he's over there, and it's a clear line of fire between yourself and him for you and the rock. Perfect. Very simple. I know who I have to hate over there, so I throw a rock at it, him, that other thing. Um, I would say that there's enormous problems in that because we, you know, we, we were, uh, I was talking about the Nazis before. They said, well, you hate Hitler, don't you? That's usually where this kind of hate thing gets posited, Godwin's Law. Um, and I would answer that. And again, this is a sensitive topic, and, you know, I probably going to get quote mind here, but I would say, do I really have enough information to hate Hitler? Is he just hate worthy? Has he crossed a certain line that actually exists? Not just something I've drawn in my own mind or we've collectively agreed upon here, but I mean, it actually exists that he has done something that is so heinous that he must be hated. And I know 
that I've got the right person there. Because again, if you look at the the mechanics and the thinking behind the Holocaust to the Shoah itself, that was the thinking. We've got the bad people. You know, it just seems logical now what we do. You know, we, we since we know that we have the bad people now in our power and we have this historical opportunity to do something about it, we'd be crazy not to do what we do with these people. Um, I don't really see how that's any different from hating anyone ever. Because you assume that you know enough about them to say that they are hate-worthy, that they are um, anathema, that they are Satan-like. Um, and I'm just referring to hate here. I'm not saying that we don't do anything about what people, you know, when people do things disruptive. I'm not suggesting that at all, and nor am I suggesting that the idea of going to war against the Nazis was a bad idea. I probably would have been all for it had I been around back then. Um, but th does that mean that I must hate anybody to do that? I don't think so. I don't think I needed to, to hate Hitler or the Germans or fascism or anything like that to say, okay, I don't want to live in a world where this takes place and I'm willing to kill to prevent that from happening if necessary or stick my neck out to be killed. Uh, hate isn't necessary for that. And in many ways, when you're learning, say, a martial art or something like that, they do say, keep your hate out of it, or at least put it to a, not a hot type of hatred, but a cool hatred, a uh, focused hatred or something like that. You want to keep your wits about you. You don't want your reason to be hijacked because you fight with your brains as much as with your body and your emotions will screw up your ability to fight with your brains. So hate in and of itself actually might not be that great of a motivator or at least in terms of uh, uh, getting results. Um, you know, the classic example of that is the Romans fighting the barbarians. You'd have a gigantic barbarian horde that overwhelmingly outnumbered the Romans, sometimes five, ten to one. And the Gauls or the Germans that they were fighting certainly did not lack bravery and they didn't lack ardor and they worked themselves up into an emotional frenzy before the, before the battle and charged headlong into the Romans. Almost suicidal bravery. And even the Romans said this, is that they'd never fought against people as brave as the Gauls or the Germans. They couldn't understand how these people worked themselves up into such a state of reckless bravery. But the Romans always beat them, though, <laughs> or almost always beat them. Even though the Germans did eventually overwhelm the Roman Empire, the, most of the time when the Romans fought them, they creamed them. Uh, why? Because the Romans were disciplined and they fought methodically and they fought using their minds and, you know, as a sort of using primitive game theory and things like this. Um, they saw it as a scientific endeavor. So you can act violently, you can act even viciously, and you can be completely um, nasty when you act. You can shove a sword into somebody else's face and not particularly hate the guy or have anything against him at all. This is just a fight that I'm engaging in. So we can actually do all the things that we do, i.e. throw prisoners or criminals in jail, punish rapists, uh, uh, you know, all this kind of thing. We can do all of that. We don't need hate to enable it. But, you know, Nietzsche once said, I think, that um, religion or Christianity is Platonism for the masses. And I would say hate is ethics for the masses or hate and guilt. It's, they're just simple things to dumb things down so that people can just sort of get simple answers to rather complex questions and simple motiva motivators to do things that are problematic, like fighting wars <laughs> um, or throwing people in jail. It's, it's morally ethical, or, or, sorry, morally problematic tossing somebody into jail for 40 years. You've got to justify that. Okay, um, simplistically speaking, in the, in the realm of um, popular ethics, as you see hammered out every day on, on Dr. Phil and um, Jerry Springer, I guess, if he's still around, or any of these daytime TV shows have to do with guilt and evil. Who are the bad people? It's very simple, uh, even though the means of finding who the bad guy is always boils down to this, this one person getting rigidly framed by the camera and, ah, we caught you, you bad person. That's how the herd, I guess you would call it, is 
has its morals fed to it. Um, nasty way to refer to the overwhelming mass of human society, isn't it? Especially for somebody who says that hate and otherizing people isn't good, but um, it does seem to look that way. Um, but, you know, it, I don't think that that actually stands up to scrutiny. I don't think that that stands up to withering scrutiny. Do we know enough about anyone to hate them? I don't think so. Um, do we know enough about anyone to even fundamentally otherize them? I don't think we do. I don't think that we can say for certain that that person needs to be deleted because they are an actual menace to the rest of us. Although even though I suppose saying that some something is a menace to the rest of us isn't necessarily saying that they're even bad. They've just got some sort of disease that we can catch from them. But to say that they're evil? Hmm. That implies a moral judgment that I don't think any of us are equipped to make. You have to be able to peer into somebody's soul, as it were, to do that. And we can't do that. Human consciousness doesn't work like that. We can see what people do. We can hear what they say. But as to what's going on inside, we don't know. I would pause the view that most of us aren't even aware of our own motivations for doing 99% of the things that we do. We just do them. Um, but hate, though, I think does imply a moral judgment. It has to, it has to be, it, you know, there has to be some sort of idea that, that this grave injustice has been done, which implies a moral ideal. Justice is an ideal, isn't it? Um, and it also implies the idea that there are, that, that if you engage in this kind of activity, it actually says something about you fundamentally. Uh, at some fundamental level, you are an error, or at, at an existential level even. In order to be hated, or in order for you to hate somebody, you have to say that there's something about that person. It might not be irreversible in them, but it's so deep and it's so malignant that any rational person would hate that person. I don't really see that any different than saying that somebody is evil. Um, at least when you're trying to intellectualize hate as something you're going to analyze, something you're going to examine. Most people, I don't think, look at their hate or their loves that way. They just feel them and they respond to them. And again, that's what gets hammered into our brains every hour of every day when we turn on daytime TV or watch a movie or a TV show or whatever. It's just medieval morality play writ large forever, all the time. Always a new sort of replay on the same thing. Good versus evil. Um, but do we really have the capacity to identify good people or evil people? I don't think that we do. Um, if we do have the capacity to decide or to determine who merits hatred... Hitler did do the right thing. He just put the wrong people in there, didn't he? It's a terrible thought, but I don't really see how, if we're going to say that hate is, um, hate is a rational response, I don't see how we can escape the logic of that. If there are those who deserve to be hated, what should we do about it?